Thank you, Alan. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming out to hear about bathhouse. I uh, appreciate that very generous introduction. It sounds pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> but I, I, I want to point out to you that I actually have no uh, formal medical training whatsoever. Right? They call me doctor, but I'm a PhD. I'm not a physician. I'm not an MD. So uh, even though we're going to talk about infection, I'm not an, an insider as a, as a trained medical professional. We'll kind of come back to that uh, point. Uh, I thought the place to start would be by sharing with you some familiar examples of biofilms so everybody's kind of on the same page about what we're talking about. What we're talking about are microorganisms, bacteria or yeast, for example, that are banded together in very dense aggregates. They're glued together with polymers that they themselves secrete and usually stuck to a surface. Okay? And uh, this, is, this is kind of radical, actually, in, in microbiology in that microbiologists and the rest of us who work with microorganisms conventionally uh, grow them in tubes or flasks as uh, single cells in free aqueous suspension. And now they're, now they're grouped together in these, for, for microbes, massive aggregates. If you're out hiking in the summertime, uh, cross a stream and slip on a slimy rock, that was a biofilm. Right? In that case, it's uh, typically a mixture of microalgae and bacteria, very different types of microbes living together in a uh, symbiotic uh, relationship. That's very typical of uh, natural environmental biofilms. Dental plaque is uh, a classic biofilm. Hundreds of different species of bacteria have been isolated from human dental plaque. And uh, dental uh, caries or cavities is a biofilm disease. The way it works is when you put uh, sugary foods into your mouth, the bacteria in the plaque or biofilm uh, uh, consume those sugars, ferment them, and excrete molecular. Um, organic acids, uh, things like acetic acid, the acid and vinegar, that lower the pH. And so if you think about this, the acids accumulate to the highest concentration, the pH drops to the furthest, uh, right at the base of the biofilm, which is to say right at the surface of the tube. And that promotes demineralization of the anatomy. Uh, another example might be the slime that accretes on a flower vase after a few days. And what I want you to um, appreciate here, we could go on and on with examples, is that this uh, biofilm concept is not something that's just been invented recently to try and explain certain chronic infections, which is the topic that we're going to zoom in on tonight. Um, it's something that we see when we go out into nature, into all kinds of engineered systems, pipelines, and cooling water towers, and now increasingly in, in, in a number of medical contexts. So uh, from my vantage point, of course, I've got a certain bias, perhaps. Uh, this is my area. But uh, to me, it looks like biofilm formation is an ancient, ubiquitous uh, survival strategy for microbes. Okay? So um, let's see. Uh, next thing. We need to do is just kind of cover a couple of basics. Let's go back to uh, uh, the essential uh, two essential constituents of a biofilm: microbial cells and these extracellular polymers that the cells actually secrete that form a highly hydrated, uh, think of uh, Jello, uh, but uh, sticky glue that holds the biofilm together. Uh, something else that uh, we need to appreciate about biofilms uh, is that when microbes band together in a biofilm, they become uh, hard to kill. They're protected from all types of uh, antimicrobial agents. So the disinfectants and antibiotics that we use uh, stop working very well. And that's true uh, for uh, brute force kind of oxidizing agents like chlorine bleach. And it's true for antibiotics that have very exquisitely specific molecular targets, very different mechanisms of action. So this is really a, this is one of the hallmarks of life in a biofilm is um, uh, protection or reduced susceptibility 
to anti-microbial agents. This is, uh, this is different, though, uh, than the super germs, the resistant super germs that you might see in the newspaper headlines. That, that's real, right? That's happening, too. That's a different set of mechanisms, right? So the resistant super germs, individual cells are resistant to the drug. Uh, the biofilm protective mechanisms depend on multicellularity, right? So if you bust the biofilm up, disperse the bacteria from it, and then put the antibiotic in, they, they become susceptible again. You can kill them again, right? So it's a reversible effect. Okay, uh, the other thing I want to toss out here is that in the last decade in the, in the biofilm uh, research community, there's been lots of uh, discussion and some evidence, too, uh, for multicellular phenomena or behaviors in biofilms. So in biofilms, we see evidence of cell-to-cell -cell communication, bacteria talking to each other via diffusible signal molecules. We see evidence of differentiation, bacteria in the same, of the same species uh, doing two different things, right? kind of a division of labor type of strategy. We see evidence of a lot of metabolic interaction cooperation. So uh, we're used to thinking about these organisms as very primitive, single-celled creatures. And when they get together in a biofilm, we kind of have to uh, click our, uh, uh, the sophistication of the, of the organism up a couple of notches. All right. There's a little bit of science for the backdrop. And now let's start uh, thinking about infection. And here, um, I'd like to start uh, by uh, kind of running through a couple of examples of classic or acute infections. Nothing to do with a biofilm, but by way of contrast to what we're going to hear when we start uh, hearing the stories of, of a biofilm infection. Okay? So, uh, one classic uh, bacterial infection might be bubonic plague, the Black Death that ravaged uh, Europe in the Middle Ages. That's caused by a bacterium called Yersinia pestis that uh, is, is carried in the guts of fleas that run right around on the backs of rats and so on. And uh, this is, or at least was, in the time of, of pre-antibiotics, a uh, swift-moving, life-threatening infection. One of, the, one of the Italian observers of the day uh, noted that victims uh, ate lunch with their friends and dinners with their ancestors in paradise. Okay, so it, it happens fast. This is a fire-breathing pathogen, and it's predatory. Um, another example would be cholera, which is caused by the bacterium Vibrio cholera, a waterborne pathogen. Uh, 19th century English observer remarked that what frightened people about cholera was the speed at which it struck its victim and brought about a painful death. Okay, so again, um, fast moving and life threatening and um, really different from what we're going to hear about in the biofilm. Let me, let me point out one other feature here that these acute infections fit very well the one germ, one uh, disease. Uh, paradigm, right? Cholera is caused by Vibrio cholera and not by anything else. Right? It's not caused by Vibrio fissure. It has to be Vibrio cholera to, to get the disease cholera. All right. Uh, okay, let's let's switch here and hear about uh, some some examples of uh, biofilm infections. The, the classic biofilm infections are those associated with implanted medical devices pieces of plastic or metal that are put in the body. And um, the issue there is that our, our bodies are actually very good at defending against microbial interlopers, but uh, a piece of plastic or metal is not tissue, right? It can't be defended to the same standard. It's harder to protect. And if some bacteria find that surface and start a biofilm there, it's going to be really hard to get, ever get rid of it. So uh, consider this uh, case history of a man with a pacemaker who uh, is admitted to the hospital. He's clearly sick. Uh, they find staph bacteria in his blood, septicemia, not a good thing. He's put on intravenous antibiotics, very aggressive antibiotic therapy, and he gets better. 
and he's discharged from the hospital. And a week later, he's back with fever, chills, tenderness. And they put him back on the antibiotic, and he gets better again. Well, they actually went through three rounds of antibiotic therapy, hospitalization, and relapse and infection before going in and just surgically removing the entire pacing unit. And when they did that um, and looked at it with microscopy, they could find on some of the surfaces that a pacemaker, especially the lead wire, staph bacteria piled up like ball bearings in a biofilm coating that wire. And, and so you see what was happening here is that um, that biofilm got big enough that it started to shed staph into the blood and create this acute exacerbation. And the antibiotic was effective at suppressing the symptoms because it could deal with the disseminated bacteria that are not in the biofilm anymore. But it can't, it couldn't actually completely resolve the infection. It couldn't kill the whole biofilm. So what happens when the patient goes off antibiotics? The biofilm regrows and the problem is back. Right? The classic sequelae of a biofilm infection, you can knock it down or temporarily control it with antibiotics, but very hard to actually cure it, it tends to recur. Another example it, uh, would be chronic osteomyelitis infection of the bone. And um, here we have a case story of a man who injured his leg as a teenager, fractured a bone acquired this infection and lived with it his whole life. Uh, he died at age 64. I don't think it was from osteomyelitis. And uh, in that case, when they went in post-mortem and, and took a specimen of this uh, dead bone, they found staph biofilm uh, piled up on it. Right? So uh, the biofilm outlasted it. Right? Presumably it was there at age 16, and almost 50 years later, uh, when he died, it was still there, even though he'd been treated with antibiotics. Um, here there's not a piece of plastic or metal, but the, the injury to the leg created uh, some, caused some of the bone to die. And that dead bone, again, is going to be poorly defended. It, it's, a, it's a potential foothold for a platform to get started, and then we get a problem. One more example. Uh, would be uh, the biofilms that uh, we think form in chronic wounds. These are, uh, for example, sores on, on a foot of somebody with diabetes or a bed sore, pressure ulcer. Uh, open, non-healing uh, wounds that stay open for uh, weeks or months or even years. They're actually very debilitating. And uh, this is one of the newer areas that we've been uh, fortunate to um, have good funding in and have been out in front of. But uh, we and others now really think that what happens is these wounds are open in the environment. Bacteria get in there, and if they build a biofilm, it's the same deal. It's going to be uh, hard to kill with topical antiseptics. It's going to be resistant to or tolerant to, to uh, systemic antibiotics and it's going to persist. And, and in this case, what happens is we get kind of a stalemate. The, the biofilm arrests the normal healing process. The body is on the move, trying to clear it, but can't. And so there's just a shutdown here and a uh, lack of healing. When we go in uh, to these wounds, well, we don't. Uh, we have clinical collaborators who are actually surgeons and, and wound care specialists. And one of the normal practices is to debride the wound or remove some of the material so we can get some of that material. And using modern gene sequencing, we can identify the bacteria that are in those um, samples. And it turns out to be a zoo of different microbes, OK? Uh, half dozen, a dozen, 20 different species of bacteria can be present in one wound. And the, the, the the dozen bacteria in patient A's wound can be different from the 17 bacteria in patient B's wound, right? And, and these are um, very different types of bacteria, including some strict anaerobes, that is to say bacteria that can't uh, tolerate the presence of oxygen. And, and that's, a, that's a bad sign, you know, if your skin is uh, providing a niche somehow for uh, an anaerobe, you know, that's, that's scary. But the point here is this is a polymicrobial infection, right? That is to say it's a mixture of species, 
And they're not the same species from one case to another. And so the one germ, one uh, disease model is, is going to be a hard fit here, right? And that's a recurrent theme in bathroom infections as well, right? Just like it was on the, the steam rock, these are often uh, mixtures and communities of, of different organisms. Okay, there's lots of other infections that have quite a bit of momentum or evidence that they're bathroom infections. I'll just mention a few and we'll be done with this part. Uh, periodontitis, uh, and biofilm below the gum lining, the pocket between the tooth and the gum. Again, it's a polymicrobial, slow-moving, smoldering infection. The body is trying to, host defenses are trying to uh, attack the biofilm. They're unsuccessful, but in the, process, in, the, in the process, they do some collateral damage to neighboring healthy tissue. And in this case, what that means is that the bone that holds the teeth in is slowly resorbing. Eventually, the teeth fall out. Um, let's see, cystic fibrosis pneumonia is an example of a, a bathroom infection. And infections with all kinds of uh, different uh, implanted devices, you know, you know, central venous catheters and urinary catheters and artificial hips and contact lenses. Um, all of these have, have evidence for, for bathroom formation as a, as a possible problem. And gonna, I think you can appreciate that the use of implanted devices has exploded in medicine in the last uh, few decades. So this is uh, you know, it's become a big deal. Um, Chronic rhinosinusitis is uh, a bathroom infection. Chronic otitis media with effusion, uh, the persistent earache that a uh, kid can't get, seem to get, or ear infection that the kid can't seem to get is a bathroom infection. And there's many others that are candidates for this. They fit this paradigm. All right, so just to summarize, uh, the kind of features of a bathroom infection it's slow moving, sometimes slow to manifest symptoms. They tend to be localized uh, rather than systemic, although there can be exacerbations that make the whole person sick. Um, they're uh, hard to manage with antimicrobial agents that just don't work very well on the biofilm. We see uh, slow but uh, significant collateral damage to neighboring healthy tissue in many of these infections. Uh, and they're just darn persistent infections that they, uh, they last. I thought I'd wrap uh, up the kind of uh, pre-discussion part here by just mentioning six issues that uh, I see as uh, barriers to um, the complete uptake of this uh, biofilm hypothesis of chronic infection into medicine. There's places where it's happening, there's physicians who hear this story and say, that is exactly what I see in, you know, in my practice. There's also lots of people who, you know, act like that. Those guys don't know anything. Um, so one of, the, one of the issues is that the bio, most of the biofilm science is pretty new, it's research-based, and it's not made it into the uh, microbiology or medical school curriculum. Right? If you go take a course in infectious disease, you may or may not hear about biofilms. Right? It's not in the textbooks, or maybe there's a couple pages. So it doesn't have as much treatment as it needs to have. Another issue is that uh, the biofilm world is a very interdisciplinary world. And um, there's insights and ideas that come up uh, far away from, our, from your own, and you have to sort of be on the look out for them or you won't hear about it. Let me dramatize that. If you go back in the literature and uh, look for the origin of the term biofilm, it appears to have been coined by the civil engineers and microbiologists who study wastewater treatment processes. Right? So the dirty water that runs down the sewer goes and gets treated before it's discharged and many of those processes are based on microorganisms that eat pollutants and many of those microbiological processes are actually biofilm processes, right? And uh, so some of the groundbreaking work in the biofilm field was done by, you know, environmental engineers. Uh, and, and you can appreciate that, the, again, just to dramatize here, the sewer engineers and the, you know, uh, orthopedic infectious disease guys 
aren't usually at the same conferences, right? They don't. They're not hearing. They're not hearing these ideas. That's an issue. Uh, another issue is the uh, 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 this one germ, one disease paradigm that's very strongly entrenched in, in medicine. It goes back to the German bacteriologist uh, Robert Koch, who formulated a beautiful, highly logical set of postulates, and they work gorgeously for these acute infections. Right? It works. It breaks down when we get these polymicrobial infections in a biofilm. Right? It's just not working anymore. But that's a barrier because people are used to thinking that way in medicine. Uh, another, there's regulatory barriers. Um, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, does not currently have a way to approve uh, anti-biofilm claims for new products that, that go after a biofilm. Okay? One of the things we're doing at the Center for Biofilm Engineering is trying to broker dialogue with uh, FDA, also EPA, uh, with, with companies, with other academics, and have education back and forth, have dialogue back and forth about the need to develop new uh, pathways and new methods for doing this. Uh, what I tell people is that you can't get the right answer to a biofilm problem using a planktonic method. By planktonic, we just mean methods in which the organisms are dispersed in the fluid as single cells. Can't get the right answer. You'll never, ever get the right answer to a biofilm problem using one of these conventional planktonic tests. So related to the re regulatory issue is there's a need for new, good, standardized biofilm methods. That's another thing that we're hard at work on uh, up at MSU at, at, our, at our center. Uh, and finally, the last issue, of course, is a need for new anti-biofilm technologies. We need something that'll work on a biofilm. I just told you that the, the usual drugs and, and disinfectants don't work well, very well. And the good news here is that uh, when you, we engage the biofilm concept, uh, there's a lot of possibilities for new ways to, to solve this, these problems. Let me just mention two. Uh, one would be to uh, stop uh, trying to kill germs and take aim at the matrix holding the biofilm together. Okay? So if we can learn how to disperse the bacteria, dissolve this matrix, then our, our drugs should work again. The body should be able to mop up those uh, dispersed cells. That doesn't require having to kill anything, right? These, these could be agents that simply uh, break the biofilm up. Another idea that's uh, still got a huge uh, hold on people and interest is the potential to come in and jam the bacterial communication lines. Right? So if this cell-cell communication or quorum sensing is a, as an important part of the biofilm defense or some other process in the biofilm, then coming in and interfering with it, again, we're not talking about killing anything, we're just talking about uh, kind of cutting the communication lines could cripple a biofilm and make it more vulnerable to uh, uh, treatment. Okay, that is the uh, really quick uh, uh, summary of the biofilm concept and its application to chronic infection. And if you'll just permit me to, uh, uh, to tell you a tiny bit about our center up at MSU, um, it's going to sound like bragging, but I don't know how else to put it. But um, I want you to know this, okay? Uh, that there's, I'm down here as kind of, actually, I've got a number of my colleagues uh, who are kind to show up here. I'm sitting in the back there. There's more than 120 of us affiliated with the Center for Biofilm Engineering, many students. Of undergraduate and graduate students, many faculty and staff. So it's a big group. We work on lots of problems, not just medical ones, but all kinds of environmental problems as well. And uh, we are the biggest, oldest, uh, best known center for biofilm research, education, and technology transfer anywhere in the world. It's right here in the backwoods of Montana at Montana State University. People come from all over the world. So, yeah.
So how am I resisting this violence? Did everybody hear that? Okay. I'm going to repeat the questions, I think, so that everybody does hear. The question is, do I have biofilms in my kitchen? If so, how am I resisting them? The answer is yes, they're there. They're, they're in the drain. Uh, they're uh, in, in little cracks and cutting surfaces. They're on the sponge. You know, the sponge starts to smell after a little while. That's not, you know, that's bacteria that are making that, that smell. So they're there. You know, again, the, good, the really good thing is that most of us, we live, we don't see them, but they're all over the place, you know? These bacteria are out there. Our bodies are used to seeing that, and uh, so we uh, we get away with it. But they're there. Yeah, we have some good pictures of biofilm uh, on the bottom of a uh, sink stream. Go on, go on and check it out. <laughs> yes. Well, biofilms are good. They're, you know, we mentioned wastewater treatment. Uh, there's some talk in, in the medical literature about um, a probiotic or healthy biofilms. You know, a biofilm that's normally present on on a mucosal surface that actually prevents the bad guys from getting a foothold. So that's that's an idea that's out there. Um, and maybe there are ways to, to use the matrix of the biofilm to actually target. Uh, it's about you know uh, a treatment and stick it to the stick it to the bathroom. There are lots of senior citizens getting and boomers getting knee replacements and hip replacements and you hear about chronic infections with joint replacement stuff too. So now they're are they trying to, to put things in the joints so that they won't? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff on it. Yeah, uh, the question is about uh, joint replacements, prosthetic joints, infections associated with those. Uh, is there something they can put in and uh, prevent the uh, infections? And, and you know, the good news is that the, inf the infection rate on like an artificial hip uh, is pretty low. It's it's a fraction of a percent. You know, so most people are going to be fine. On the other hand, if you're one of the unlucky, you know, uh, couple in a hundred. That get one of these uh, deep infections on a, on an artificial hip. It's it's really you know, it's really awful. They end up having to surgically remove the the infected hip, put you in a bed without a hip, and put you on antibiotics for six weeks or something to try to really clear everything out. And then they try again, put a you know, put a new hip in. So it's pretty traumatic. Um, Yes, uh, one of the things we do up at our center is to interact with a lot of companies uh, uh, that are trying to develop coatings or technologies to um, you know, put an antimicrobial agent on the surface of, of a, a titanium implant or, or create a surface that the bacteria won't, just won't stick to very well. It's not easy things to do, but it's happening and there, um, I think we'll, we'll see more of that. You know, if you if you can prevent uh, one of these infections, it ends up being worth the price of you know whatever the hundred bucks or for the coating or something. Yes. So are there any uh, medical diagnostic tests tests that can identify a biofilm before it gets into a fulminating infection? That is a great question. The question is, are there any diagnostic tests for diagnosing the presence of a biofilm? And the answer, the short answer is no. And I should, I should add this to my list of barriers because it's a huge one. These infections are often kind of cryptic because they're localized. And in fact, if you've got a hip that's giving somebody trouble, pain, an artificial hip, you can go in and sample the synovial fluid around there and try to grow bacteria out of it. And lots of times you won't get anything, right? Because you didn't get the biofilm. And so, uh, it's, it's a hard problem, but it's also a huge opportunity. I mean, if somebody could come up with a way to do that, it would really be a powerful 
advance and we would know, ah, now this catheter really is infected, we need to do something. Um, thank you for, for bringing that one up. Yes? Um, I'm thinking about plaque on teeth. No matter what I do when I go to the dentist, if I use a water pick, if I use toothbrush, whatever, I still have it. Are there ways to get rid of that biofilm or foods to avoid so that you don't have that problem? Uh, questions about plaque on teeth and the reality that you can never get rid of it completely, no matter who, you know, how hard you work at it, which is true. But toothbrushing works. It removes some of the biofilm, right? It knocks it down. And actually mechanical removal is still one of the best ways to deal with a biofilm problem, right? So I brush my teeth and it helps, right? You can use a mouthwash and microbial mouthwash. It'll help a little bit. You can floss. All those things help reduce the plaque. And, and it, with, with plaque, there, is always, there are always going to be bacteria there, but it's, again, it's a matter of kind of the balance here. At some point, the biofilm gets too big and things are going to go kind of spiral down into uh, disease. Uh, and, yeah. Yes, in back of the room. Old-fashioned ways of getting rid of biofilms, uh, sunlight, baking soda, vinegar, salt. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Um, there's a there's a big interest right now in the research world of biofilms, uh, uh, looking to plants for botanical compounds that uh, disrupt or prevent biofilm formation as well. So um, there's lots of possibilities, and. You know, I guess I'll just remark here that the, the antibiotics and drugs that we do have that work on bacteria have all been discovered and developed and optimized based on their ability to kill individual free-floating cells, bacteria. And so if we go back to the natural world and use a biofilm method from the beginning to find out what works on a biofilm, we're going to find things that work. They're out there. They just haven't been, uh, we haven't done that yet, or it's just happening now. Yes? Is there a, one bacteria that seems to be the mother of biofilms that, that, that tends to be the first that all these other polymicrobial, the other, the other microbes start to work with? And if there, if there is, um, are there vaccines that can work for prevent in advance, you know, to prevent that without the trick? Oh, that's a good question. So the first one is about, is there a kind of poor bacterium, a mother of all biofilms that starts the process off? Uh, and I don't, I don't think in general that there is. Uh, so again, if you look at the tree of life and all the different organisms, uh, most of them are microorganisms, for one thing. The, the little piece that's plants and animals is pretty small. And the ability to form a biofilm is all over that tree of life. And so this, I think this goes back a long ways, and there's lots of organisms that can do this. Um, that said, there are, you know, when you brush your teeth and you have to start with a really clean tooth, there are certain bacteria that hit that surface first and, and put down the first layer of biofilm, and then there's others that stick to those, and kind of, it goes on like that. So there is, a, there is some kind of a succession that happens. And if you could interrupt one, some of those early steps, that might be helpful. Uh, Eric, remind me of yours. Vaccines. Yeah, vaccines. Um, why can't we get a vaccine for a biofilm? And um, you know, one answer there is that it's polymicrobial, and there's a zillion different uh, strains out there, and you have to have a lot of different vaccines. Um, the other one is that we just, you know, we need to know a little bit more about uh, kind of a biofilm specific antigen. So, for, you know, Staph, Staphylococcus aureus it, uh, is one of the big troublemakers on these 
implanted uh, devices. So you could have, it might be worth trying to figure out how to stop staff that way. But what we need uh, is some kind of biofilm specific antigen that we can use to develop the vaccine. There's been a little bit of work like that, but hardly, hardly anything. I, it hasn't, you know, hasn't hit yet. Is the biochemical structure of the polysaccharide matrix well characterized, and is it pretty heterogeneous? Uh, no and yes. The question is, is the biochemical structure of the polysaccharide matrix well characterized, and is it heterogeneous? So the truth is that uh, we've only been studying this matrix carefully with modern kind of biochemical genetic approaches for 10 or 20 years. So way less, and we know way less about the matrix of the biofilm than we do about the cells themselves, right? Again, you can't study the matrix in a conventional test tube culture because it's not there. You have to grow a biofilm. And it turns out that it's very diverse. So it's not just polysaccharides, but there's also a lot of protein in the matrix of, of, of the biofilm, and even extracellular DNA. So this is uh, just in the last few years, a lot of momentum uh, you think, we think about uh, DNA as the sacred genetic code kept kind of locked up, and here it is being used as mortar to uh, glue uh, the biofilm together, but it looks like that happens. Um, it's pretty sticky stuff. So it's chemically diverse, the polysaccharides, can, uh, polysaccharide chemistry is very complex and can be very diverse. Even one single, you know, I, I made a list uh, for a talk a couple of years ago of the different matrix polymers that people have uh, identified in one famous you know, biofilm forming organism, Pseudomonas serigenosa. And I think it was about 10, there were about 10 different things, so it's, it's complicated. Yes? Um, many of these medical companies that um, make these catheters are putting silver Uh, so the question is about using silver, and uh, there are companies putting silver coatings. Uh, now everybody's calling it nano silver because it sounds good on catheters. Uh, silver has natural antimicrobial properties. It just it has natural antimicrobial properties. So, in fact, uh, you know, um, I guess if you at least if you were wealthy, you know, a century ago, you could get a silver catheter, <laughs> but. Um, uh, they, they work a little bit, right? They're not, they don't solve the problem completely, but they, they, I think they do reduce the incidence of infection. That's kind of yesterday's technology applied to try to stop a biofilm. I think we're going to see, you know, uh, better, better antimicrobial approaches, but um, uh, there's a lot of silver out there in wound dressings and catheters and, and uh, it has some efficacy, I think. How has the machine become the largest biofilm center? Um, the question is a historical one. How has MSU become the largest biofilm center? And that is largely through the uh, uh, prescient vision of our founder, a man named Bill Chiraklis, who uh, uh, moved up to Bozeman and joined the faculty in the, in the, from Rice in the uh, mid-70s and I came with a number of companies he was consulting with at that time, mostly oil companies as it turns out at that time. Uh, oil, a lot of biofilm trouble in the oil business. And a very, very strong vision of uh, interdisciplinary teamwork, of interaction with industry. And uh, he worked for you know, 12 years uh, building that program and that vision and uh, won in 1990 a big grant from the National Science Foundation called Engineering Research Center Award, which um, the, the kind of thing that tend to go to powerhouse engineering schools like uh, Georgia Tech or MIT, so there were a few eyebrows that went up when they put one in Montana. Um, and tragically, uh, Bill died a couple years later to cancer. Um, but uh, the group really pulled together and was very successful in that NSF program. And we graduated from it. 
because it only it has a fixed lifetime of 11 years in 2001, and we're still uh, going very strong. So we got in early, and uh, the field is hotter now than it ever has been. If you just look at the, if you look at the literature, it's just going like this. It still is. I can't keep up with it anymore. But uh, we got in early. We've got a big group. We've got more uh, industrial, you know, sponsors and, and connections than anybody, and, and we're a hub in that uh, world now. Have you studied the, if there is any relationship between biofilms and plaque in the blood vessels? Well, the question is about the relationship between uh, biofilm and plaque in blood vessels and arteries. And, uh, we haven't, although the last conference I was at, my table mate was telling me about finding bacteria in uh, arterial plaques. I haven't seen anything about that, so you never know. I mean, again, uh, it, they're, they're hard to diagnose until you actually go inside that gooey stuff and look by microscopy, by genetic techniques, by molecular probes for the presence of clusters of bacteria. So who knows how many other uh, infections or problems, you know, we can find a biofilm for. Let's go back here to the back of the deck. Does, does turbulence from flow prevent the biofilm, such as in a stream or bloodstream? Yeah, the question is, does turbulence in a fluid flow uh, prevent the biofilm? No. Uh, they're very tenacious, and um, you can get them, you know, in the lab, we can get them to grow under very low shear conditions, and we can get them to grow under very, very high shear conditions. And they're actually, um, uh, they're, these are uh, rubbery, viscoelastic structures. And kind of, sorry to be gross, but think snot. And uh, what that means is that they're very good at absorbing energy from the fluid and dissipating it and resisting uh, removal. So hydrodynamics is one of the reasons that there's a lot of engineers involved. It's extremely important uh, for processes of biofilm uh, removal and also for mass transport of nutrients and products in and out of the biofilm. So there's a lot of work that's happened at that interface. It matters, but they're, they're tough. They don't have any problem uh, holding on. Yes? From what I understand, you're um, actually getting a new microscope, and I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. Uh, yes, the um, question is, we're getting a new microscope, and yes, we are. Uh, microscopy is um, extremely important in what we do, because we're talking about um, uh, creatures and assemblages that are really small. I mean, a pretty, pretty healthy biofilm is maybe 100 microns thick, it's about as thick as a piece of paper or human hair. So uh, we, we rely on microscopy a great deal, and we, we really try to push the envelope of what can be done. And uh, so we have recently um, won two big grants, one from National Science Foundation and a matching award from the Murdoch Charitable Trust to uh, completely overhaul our uh, microscope facility, uh, and especially a, a type of microscope called a confocal scanning laser microscope. It uses a laser, and actually what we can do with that is to uh, optically slice through the biofilm. We're not truly cutting it with a laser, we're just we're optically kind of slicing it like a loaf of bread. We can see all the layers up and down through a biofilm. And, uh, we're really excited about that. Our microscopy facility manager, Betsy Pitts, is here tonight. She helped us uh, write that proposal, and is, uh, there she is, way in the back, and uh, help makes, makes microscopy happen up at our center. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you. Yes? I, I wonder sometimes, though, today, if our, well, we use promiscuously, we use antibiotics. It's getting easier to talk to patients about taking them when you start to explain some of the relationships to, to uh, resistance and everything else like that. I wonder, too, I hardly missed any work in over 50 years in medicine, and yet exposed constantly to things. 
And there's evidence now, I think, that asthma happens to be a little more common because we're being too careful about bacteria. You know, people have babies and they want to sterilize everything when the, from the moment the kid's born he's got bacteria from stem to stern. And I suspect that that old comment that you got to eat a pound of dirt is probably not terribly bad. And that people, by trying to resist exposure to anything, are not letting their immune system develop the muscles to be able to handle some of this stuff. And people that take good care of themselves, don't smoke, uh, do the other things that are necessary, I would venture a little more resistant to getting into trouble than others that have a different way of life. So this is a, a comment about uh, the development of the immune system by, by having exposure to microbes in the environment. Maybe that's a, a darn good thing, and there's going to be dirt for sale on your feet. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, that's not my area, but uh, one thing I can say is that another, another huge area of opportunity is the intersection of biofilms and immunology. Came up with the vaccine question. There's just not very much that's happened at that intersection yet. There's a lot of opportunity there. Another thing, another remark I would say here is that you know you don't you won't miss it's, you're unlikely to catch a biofilm infection from somebody. People who get a biofilm infection have some uh, compromise, whether it's the implant, uh, whether it's a poorly perfused limb, uh, some comorbidity that predisposes them to, to you know having to get started. So most healthy people aren't going to just all of a sudden get a bathroom information. I heard, I believe it was on a PBS special, that sharks, shark skin, they never have any growth. They never have any slime. They don't have barnacles. They don't, I mean, you look at whales and other fish, and they're covered from head to toe. And there's something about the geometry, the physical, of the denticles. And there's a company that's making surgical fabric or shield that has the, uh, mimics the shark's denticles, the bacteria will not adhere and will not grow on it? Uh, I haven't heard of that. This is uh, the idea that sharks, uh, their skin uh, resists fouling, and if there's a company who's trying to mimic that uh, and, and create surfaces that won't, you know, let a bathroom or bacteria stick to them, I love this idea. And I love the idea of biomimicry, of, of looking to the natural world for solutions to these problems. Um, I haven't heard of that particular one, but yeah. Well, what we, you said, that what they could do is should put that film in a petri dish, and uh, the same bacteria that they could grow in en masse in a regular petri dish, they put it in with the shark skin, and it would not grow just a few isolated colonies. Yeah, so you know we have we test a lot of. Um, uh, so actually, the guy who does this is in the back too. Garth James runs our medical biofilms lab, and uh, we get companies coming to us all the time with their G whiz uh, shark skin or foo foo dust that guaranteed stops a biofilm in its tracks, and um, some of them actually work. A lot of them, you know, when we put them in our in our real biofilm models, eh, no, sorry, it didn't work so well. But some of them, some of them actually work. So I think we are going to find things that work. Yes. Do you think we're adding to the problem by using our antibacterial soaps in medical facilities as well as in our homes? Uh, the question is, are we adding to our problems by using antibacterial soaps and uh, disinfecting? Uh, computer keyboards and whatever else is out there. And yeah, I, you know, it's not my, uh, it's not quite my area, but I, my personally, I don't think that those technologies are necessary. I think in healthy individuals, your body is used to seeing dirt by the bucket loads, bacteria on sponges and cutting boards, and you don't need any bacterial in there. So that's just, I think that's a way of selling the product, uh, and uh, you know, if I was gonna 
getting go in the hospital and get a urinary catheter that might stand for three weeks, I'd ask for the antimicrobial one. But do I do not, I need antimicrobial socks? Probably not. <laughs> well, we're not gonna do that experiment. <laughs> yeah. Are enzymes being produced in the polymers? So are are there enzymes that could degrade the polymers in a biofilm? Absolutely. Uh, we actually have two of our member companies have, are, have commercial interests in enzymes, and one of the ways that they would be used is to chop a biofilm up. Um, one of the small companies, uh, a company called King Biotech, uh, is, uh, had, has a, a license to an enzyme called Dispersin B that chops up one of the uh, polysaccharides that turns out to be a recurrent um, feature of, of many biofilms, and so they're trying to find applications for that. Yeah, exactly. Yes? Is the slime on a fish a biofilm? Is the slime on a fish a biofilm? Uh, wow, you're yeah, way out of my uh, territory <laughs> there. Um, and I, I guess I've never heard of anybody who's tried to characterize it. I'm guessing it's not. I'm guessing that the slime on a fish is our polymers produced by the fish skin that actually reduce the drag for the fish. And uh, um, yeah, but the slime on the rock, you know, that's down, down on the bottom, there probably is a bottom. Uh, just to go back to the uh, biomimicry idea, because this came back into my head. You know, there's a lot of plants that fish and plants that live in water, even dirty water, and don't get all fouled over with a bathroom. How do they do that? So some marine biologists down in Australia went out into Botany Bay and uh, started investigating this red algae, uh, the Lucia pulchra, and were able to isolate from it um, a class of molecules, uh, brominated furanones, if you want to know, that turned out to be uh, inhibitors of one of these uh, communication pathways. And you know, this is just really exciting and cool. They the pictures of it loaded into a piece of plastic, dumped in the bay, and you know, it's clean, and the other one's just shaggy. And um, they started a company and worked for 10 years to try to commercialize it. Did, and they're great scientists, and I think the company just folded last year. I mean, I, I, everything I can see, I think it's gone. It's hard to do. There's a lot of barriers to actually uh, taking something like that. These compounds turn out to be not completely innocuous. You know, they're a little bit toxic, and so um, that and, and other issues. Uh, but you know, there might be. There's probably others. But this idea of looking to the natural world for uh, solutions is, is a good one. Uh, yeah, there was a question for you. You talked about how these biofilms, if you could uh, disintegrate the slime, that then the, the bacteria that's in there would become susceptible to antibiotics and treatment and so forth. Uh, isn't most slime broken down with surfactants? Like, So, uh, this is a question about uh, can't slime in the matrix of a biofilm be broken down with surfactants? And uh, yes, part way. So, if we grow a biofilm in, in the lab and dump in a surfactant, we can get some part of the biofilm to, to release. Uh, it will disrupt some of it. And even more intriguing than that, uh, there's a number of uh, case studies out here now where people have shown that um, bacteria naturally produce surfactants, biosurfactants, that uh, act to disperse cells out of the biofilm. So we didn't get to go through the whole life cycle here, but they grow and build a biofilm. They're, they also are released from the biofilm. They're also turned back into the water, right? That, that's happening all the time. And uh, one idea is to understand the natural dispersal or detachment processes, and some of those appear to be mediated by surfactants that the organisms themselves produce that help them escape. So, 
yeah, surveillance might be part of the picture. They don't look like a slam dunk, but that's enough to do it all by themselves. In fact, that's, that's you know, my opinion here is that biofilms are tough enough that we're probably not going to solve anything with just one chemistry or one approach. We might need a combination of an antimicrobial, or a surfactant, or some enzyme that disperses the biofilm, and then, and then a quorum sensing inhibitor that, you know, uh, interferes with the communication. We probably need some uh, kind of multi-pronged approach to, to get the job done. Yeah. Yeah. The, the whole focus is on that biofilm is bad. How are biofilms beneficial? Uh, is there any positives to biofilms? In, in health in particular? In health in particular? Uh, hmm. Well, again, there is, there is, there are some people who uh, promote the idea that there are natural biofilms present on healthy tissue. You know, there's, there's, a, there's bacteria in your skin, there's bacteria in your mucous membranes that actually uh, function somewhat to exclude pathogens or uh, the bad guys. Um, Garth, is there another idea I'm missing there? Well, there's certainly the, uh, the concept of a, of a healthy dental flap. You know, when you go from, and, uh, and there's even probiotic products on the market to promote healthy dental flap. So that's, and the skin's another thing. Digestive tract. That's the digestive tract that actually is I think, we'll, I think we'll hear more about that. Um, I, the, my, you know, we're going to learn more about the microbial ecology of the human body and what's normal, what's healthy, and hopefully there'll be ways to you know, push things in a healthy direction. Yeah. We'll another question up here. Uh, microbes or bacteria, we think of it as dividing when they reproduce. But in fact, the type of sex that goes on with bacteria where they're exchanging the DNA, we find a microbe that does that to a large extent, put that on the inserts in the body and on your teeth or something like that. In other words, use a bacteria to avoid a biofilm. Uh, so uh, this is the idea of using a bacteria um, as a control agent to deliver DNA that you know might uh, help uh, prevent a biofilm, and uh, the the version of that that we're seeing right now is the use of bacteriophage viruses that go after bacteria as ways to uh, um, kill them, and the 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 cute trick that was published a couple of years ago was to engineer a bacteriophage that naturally targets staph and can lice and kill staph bacteria. But what they added into that was this the this enzyme that I just mentioned a little while ago, this dispersin B enzyme that breaks down the staph polymer, the polymer that the staph uses to build a bathroom. So now when, when one of these phage particles, viral particles, infects a bacterial cell, it multiplies inside the cell, it busts that cell open, so it makes a bunch more. It's a self-propagating control agent, and then it starts to break down the, uh, it starts to break down the matrix. So, yeah, there are, there are biocontrol strategies that are being talked about. There's also a lot of, you know, there's, there's gonna be issues with those as well, but uh, there's a company called Novophage that's trying to do that. Yes? Biofilms classified as parasites. Uh, no, I don't think so exactly. But uh, I actually like that analogy for the chronic wound. You know, if the if cholera is a predatory infection, the lion, the biofilm infection is more like the leech. You know, it's just in there. It's going to feed off things and hang out as long as it can. Are they involved in decay of dead matter? Absolutely. So all the invisible recycling that's going on on the forest floor and everywhere else, that's microorganisms. 
they're latching onto the surface of that leaf and they're uh, chewing it up. Absolutely, that's one of the good things they do. They, uh, uh, and and uh, you know, a whole bunch of work that we've done up at our center relates to bioremediation, using microbes to clean up contaminated soil or groundwater. And uh, so there are beneficial uses for sure. Got time for one more question. One more question. Uh, let me give uh, you a chance. I have a grand niece who has cystic fibrosis. Is uh, the biofilms a cystic fibrosis? Fibrosis always polymicrobial, or does pseudomonas get started? That's often a problem. This is a question about cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic disease. So here the defect is a genetic one. It tips the balance in the lungs and makes them not as well defended. And they get colonized by, by bacteria that um, look to be organized in biofilms. And uh, the question there is, it, it, are those uh, there's a, again, the same organism I mentioned, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is the one that everybody talks about in, in CF, and it's kind of the famous one. But I think those infections are polymicrobial. Um, Pseudomonas is, you know, kind of gets to be the bad actor. But, but there's other things in there. And there's people trying to study, you know, the, the interactions between those, those particular bacteria to figure out what that adds to the process. Okay, well, I'd like to thank Dr. Stewart for an excellent talk.